please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 5. As we've gone through John chapter 5, we saw first of all a miracle. Jesus healed a man who was unable to walk, and then a controversy started. Uh, The Jews were uh, upset that he was healing on the Sabbath. They were upset that he compared himself to God. Uh, They were so upset they wanted to kill him. And the last two weeks, we've looked at the first two parts of Jesus' answer, uh, which goes all the way from verse 19 to verse 47 to these people who want to kill him. Today we'll read the final portion, uh, John 5, verses 33 to 47. Give your attention to God's holy word. Jesus says, You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man. But I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John. For the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This ends our reading of God's word. Well, let's review. If you're going to try to kill Jesus, you remember? First, if you're going to try to kill Jesus, you should at least know who it is that you're trying to kill. Uh, That's what Jesus started with. He presented himself as the true Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, uh, to uh, these Jews who wanted to kill him. So if you're going to try to kill Jesus, he said, I want you to know who I am. Second, if you're going to try to kill Jesus, you should know how badly you are going to fail. Jesus is the one who has life in himself. Jesus is the judge of the world. Uh, He is not going to be destroyed by you. You aren't going to be able to make him go away and disappear. Well, today, if you are going to try to kill Jesus, one more lesson. If you're going to try to kill Jesus, if you want to make him go away, if you want to destroy what what he is building, you might want to pause and think about why you are the sort of person who wants to kill. See, after Jesus explains his identity and and teaches about himself, he moves the focus to the listener. He looks to these Jews and he asks them to think about what what is going on in their hearts? What what is going on that that makes them want to act this way? And, And again, although John tells us he's speaking to Jews, Jesus is teaching us something that's not about ethnicity. He is reminding us all there is something in our hearts that makes us want to destroy there's, there's something in our hearts that makes us become angry, not just at people that we don't like, but you know how it goes. You become angry at your spouse whom you love. You become angry at your best friends. You become angry at your parents. You become angry at your children. You become angry at God himself. Sometimes it's God that we want to make go away. 
And so Jesus aims at our hearts, and yet in verse 34, he tells us his purpose statement. Why is he going to tell us all these things about ourselves? He says, I say these things so that you may be saved. Jesus is wanting to give you hope. Jesus wants you to know that as bad as your heart may be, as much as there may be that's twisted inside and that that desire to destroy that lives in you, Jesus is on a mission to forgive your sins, to give life as you trust in him. And that's the good news we need to hear today, that first Jesus knows your heart, but knowing your heart, Jesus also still calls you to trust in him and to receive his free gift of eternal life. So what does Jesus know about your heart? First point is this. Jesus knows that you are drawn to what is good. Jesus knows that you are drawn to what is good. Now this might not be what we would expect. As Jesus Jesus is being attacked and condemned, you would you'd think maybe he'd want to fight back. But he begins, I think, with a real compliment to these people. He starts talking to them about John the Baptist. He says, you have sent to John. This is a reference to to what we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, that a delegation came to ask John the Baptist, who are you? What are you talking about? He said, you've sent to John, and John has testified to the truth. Uh, John was a good person. He was somebody who was telling them the truth. They went and they asked him, why was John doing this? Jesus says, the testimony which I receive is not for man. John wasn't doing this so that Jesus would believe. John was doing this for them. And Jesus is reminding them of this. He says, I say these things so that you may be saved. And John was a good thing. He said, John was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. As, as we go through the Gospel of John, we get many images of light and darkness. And and this world in its sin is is compared to a dark world. It's we, we live in a long night where there are no stars, there's no moon, there's, there's nothing to give us light. But then there was John the Baptist. And it, with, all, with all that darkness, it was like somebody suddenly struck a match and they lit a lamp and, and there was an opportunity to see. There's a light. And it wasn't the brightest light, but it was there. It was real. And people were drawn to it. All these Jews, these people, they all came and they gathered around this light while it was shining. As, as Jesus speaks, perhaps John is in prison by this point. It seems that the light's not shining. We know that that light went out, that John was murdered by Herod eventually. But while the light was there, they rejoiced in the light. They were drawn to that light. And this is something that we recognize in our own experience, that we are often drawn to light. Maybe, maybe Maybe you've had a difficult life, but you can point to those lights that have happened. Maybe it was parents, or maybe it was a grandparent. Uh, maybe there was a certain teacher or a coach. Somebody, somebody who wasn't simply using you. Somebody who wasn't simply out to get you, but somebody who truly cared about you. Uh, somebody who would tell you the truth. Somebody who wanted to make you better. There are these lights that we have that come in our lives. You're drawn to those sorts of things. Jesus knows that about you. You're drawn to other good things. Jesus goes on to say that he has a greater testimony than John and what John was doing. And what is that? It is the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do. What are these works? Well, one one summary of, of Jesus' life is that he went about doing good. And you can read through all the Gospels and you can see all the good things that Jesus did. You can read about him healing people and about feeding people and restoring children to their parents and welcoming those who are outcasts and caring for the poor and having compassion on the crowds. Jesus was constantly doing good. And again, people are drawn to that. People loved that. And and again, this is something today in this world where we see good people or we see good things happening, we're attracted to that. You've probably seen the the billboards from the Pass It On campaign. Uh, All these examples of people who are virtuous people in some way and and they have a slogan or something, an example of how to be virtuous. What's what's the purpose? Well, it seems to be if we can put more good out in this world and people are drawn to what is good, maybe we can increase the, the good and the light that is in this world. And at a certain level, 
it works. We like good things. Why do we like good things? Well, because they come from a good God. They come from a good God. That's what Jesus says in verse 36 about his works. Just as he said about John, the purpose is to testify. The works testify about me that the Father has sent me. That's why we like good things, because there's a good God who has made a good world. And we are, we are built to be attracted to that. God has designed us to, to have a recognition of that. Even with all of our sin, there's still an ability to have some light come through. Now, the Jews would have understood this. They would have been right on, on the same page with Jesus. They would have said, yes, everything that's good is a gift from God and it comes from God. Uh, maybe uh, many of you are probably in the same situation where you say, absolutely. The, re- the reason there are any, any amount of goodness in this world is because God has given it. Uh, may- maybe you aren't sure. Maybe you aren't sure if you uh, believe in God. You're here listening. You're wondering. Well, it's a, it's a question worth asking. Why do I believe there is such a thing as good anyway? Evolution doesn't produce good. Science can't explain good. There's nothing about this natural world that says one thing should be good and the other should be bad, and yet all of us are attracted to good things. Where does that category come from? Jesus says it comes from God. These good things, these good people that are in our lives, they point us toward God himself. And so you're drawn to that, and yet Jesus wants to make something very clear. Your love for good things does not save you. Your love for good things does not save you. Jesus goes on in verse 37. He's talked about John the Baptist. He's talked about the good works he does. He says, and the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. Well, how has the Father testified? Well, there are a couple moments in Jesus' life when when God audibly spoke from heaven. Perhaps he refers to that. I think likely it's a a comprehensive statement uh, on just that principle of theology, that God has made all good things, that, that this world that God has created testifies about Jesus Christ, that the scriptures that God gave, that all of his kindness toward us is pointing us toward Jesus Christ. But as much as we have all of that, Jesus looks at his listeners who, who would have wanted to affirm all that, that theology about God giving all good things, and he says something very blunt to them. He says, You have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his form. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. They have failed four times. They have not heard. They have not seen. They do not have his word. They do not believe. Now, of course, in a sense, they have heard. Right? They were there. They talked to John the Baptist. They, they have seen the works that Jesus Christ has done. They, they have all these points of contact. But Jesus is talking about something spiritual, that there is, there is a true hearing, there is a true seeing that will lead to a conviction about the word of God and it will lead to trusting in him. It's just as he often said with his parables. He said, people have ears, but they do not hear. They have eyes, but they do not see. Why? Because they are not turning to God. So I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of these Jews who were listening a little bit and and think about what it would be like to hear Jesus say these things, to, to commend certain good things and to develop these ideas and then to say a very hard line, you do not here. You don't see. You don't have the word. You don't believe. How can he tell these people that they have never heard God? How could he say that to them? You know, that's, that's someone like Herod or the Romans, not the Jewish people. You know, th- these are not just people who, who give lip service to God. Th- these are people who suffer tremendously to maintain faithful worship to God. These are people who are enslaved by a conquering emperor who does all sorts of awful things to them. You can read about the murderous ways of Herod and other rulers, and they persist and insist that they will not follow other gods. They will only follow the true God, and they've maintained this scrupulously so that they can worship God. Jesus says to them, you have not heard. 
what would it be like if he said that to you? If you've not just, not just I've called myself a Christian my whole life, but I have devoted myself to this. I have, I have built my entire lifestyle around my belief in God. And I have loved what is good and I have avoided what is evil and I've done the best I can as much as I am able. I think that perhaps the Jews, as they hear this, you know, you know, they're already angry enough to want to kill him. I don't think this helps perhaps to be rebuked this way. And it might not help us either if we, if we imagine being told something like that. And yet, it brings us back to that basic question of goodness. What is it in our hearts that when, it, when we hear a rebuke, it makes us angry? What is it in our hearts that when somebody tells us we're wrong, when somebody tells us we have failed, wants to lash out and defend ourselves? Our good hearts are not so good when we look at them more closely. And Jesus wants to go on and he wants to, to put, put a specific point on this and talk about the scriptures. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Again, the Jews loved the scriptures. The, when he says search the scriptures, he is not using an idle word. These are people who would memorize large portions of scripture. They would devote their lives to the study of scripture. Uh, they, they gave themselves wholly to the scriptures. And the scriptures are a good thing. The scriptures are the best thing, the best possession that people can have in this life. They're the word of God to us. And they want the right thing. They want to have eternal life. He says, he says that about them. You want what you should be wanting. And yet for all of this, they have failed. Because he says at the end of verse 39, it is these that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Listen to what Jesus says about the scriptures. He's, he's giving us a clue to how to read the entire Bible. You know, how do you read through the Old Testament? Well, you read it listening for it to testify about Jesus. And he's, he's not saying this passage or that passage, but he's saying broadly, as you read through the, the scriptures, which for them would have been what we now call the Old Testament, they are talking about me. They are talking about Jesus, he says. So when you go through stories, when you read laws, when you read prophecies, whatever it may be, they are to point you to Jesus Christ. And Jesus is explaining, he's not saying these things to make people angry. He's not, not saying this to make them upset. He's saying this to save their lives. They want eternal life, but there is only one way to have eternal life. They must come to Jesus Christ. Now the Jews would have just disagreed. They, they would have said, that is not the source of life. There is some other source of life. It's not Jesus Christ. They, they would have wanted to, to find eternal life, to hear the promises about life like we read in Deuteronomy 32. It said, read these words. This is your life. They want to say, it's, it's some other life than Jesus Christ. But you see here how Jesus draws a line. For all that we may pursue that is good in this world, and there are many things that are good in this world, and for all that we may pursue that is right and that is true and that is beautiful, there is a very basic line drawn at Jesus Christ. You must trust in him. Apart from him, none of it will save. None of it will help. He is the only Savior. And so the Jews are challenged. Will they accept Jesus? If if you're here, if you do not consider yourself a Christian, the challenge is, to, is the same challenge to you. It would be, will I accept Jesus Christ or not? Will I submit to him? Will I confess that I am a sinner? Uh, will, will I acknowledge that he came, he lived, he died on the cross for my sin, he rose from the dead, and he is the only Lord? But if you do call yourself a Christian, the, the question changes just a little bit. Because you have said yes to that. You have said, yes, I do accept Jesus Christ. And yet there's still an opportunity here to search the heart and say, have I done it the way he tells me to? Have, have I truly come to Jesus Christ on his terms? And that's what the final part of the passage is for. It is designed for self-examination. And so we'll look at two different questions for self-examination as we finish the passage. First is this. 
Where do I get my glory? Where do I get my glory? What is glory? Glory, glory is being significant. G- glory is what matters. Glory is what we appreciate and what we exalt and praise. Verse 41, Jesus says about himself, I do not receive glory from men. Uh, Jesus is glorious. He is the most glorious. He understands that about himself. He knows his significance, his importance. He knows what makes him matter. And it's not that people say nice things about him. That's not where it comes from. His glory comes from God. He is the eternal Son of God, is is the Father who commends him and the Spirit who confirms him. He doesn't receive his glory from other people. Then he says, but I know you. He says, you do not have the love of God in yourselves. Now again, think about the audience. If you took a poll of the people listening and ask them one by one, do you love God? I'm sure every single one would say yes, and they could point to a very extensive lifestyle that would prove it. And yet Jesus says to them, you do not have the love of God in yourselves. How can he say this? Well, he goes on. I have come in my Father's name And you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? How does Jesus know this? He knows it by watching how they receive. You see how that word receive keeps being repeated. What are they receiving? That is, what is it that gives them glory? What is it that satisfies their need to be significant? What is it that tells them that they matter? What is it that tells them they are important, that they are appreciated? Jesus says, first of all, it's not me. You're not, you're not looking to me. And notice how he identifies himself as uh, and this glory is the only God. You, he's, he's distinguished uh, father and son, especially here. He comes back and says, very clearly, there is only one true God. And, and so again, we speak in terms of Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He says, you aren't, you aren't finding this glory from the only God. Instead, you're getting it from one another. The, the way that you know that you're doing a good job in life, the way that you know that you love God and that you're succeeding as believers and so on, he says, is because you're telling each other that. And you're, you're affirming one another, and that's what is giving you glory. This is what we must search our hearts about. Where do I get my glory? And there's, there's two ways I think we can get this wrong. We can make what I call a good person mistake and a bad person mistake. I'll start with the good person mistake. The good person mistake is is sort of directly what he's saying, where you could look at yourself and as you consider your heart and say, why do I think I matter? Why do I think I'm significant? Well, other people have told me I'm significant. Other people have confirmed me. They've told me, good job. They've said, we we appreciate you. They've said these things. And and they were right, because I did do a good job. I, I, I'm not all messed up. I, I did do a good job, and I know that about myself, and, and I understand that they are right. And, and this, is, this is the way to receive glory that doesn't quite understand the heart of sinfulness. Because the issue is not whether you did a good job. You may have done a good job. The issue is whether you have a love for yourself or a love for God. Or say it another way, the question is not whether you would make a good neighbor. You know, if if I were to look at everyone in the world and say, who do I want to be my next door neighbor? I would want somebody who who doesn't steal from me and somebody who doesn't play loud music all night long and somebody who's polite and those sorts of things. Those are all good things. But this is not a test about would you make a good neighbor or something like that. This is a test of your love. Do you love God? Or do you love yourself? And when people tell you good job and you say, yes, I did do a good job. Thank you. That encourages me. It's all about you. And that's what Jesus rebukes is that attitude. And no matter how many good things you do on the outside, if your heart is turned toward yourself, Jesus says, repent. You're receiving glory from other people, making it all about yourself. Repent and turn to God. 
That's the good per person mistake. The bad person mistake is a reaction, I think, to this. The bad person mistake would be to say this. Well, I'm not supposed to receive glory from men. I'm not going to receive any glory at all. In fact, I, I know that all glory belongs to God alone. alone. And I, I know about myself. Well, I am, I am completely and only worthless. And that's the last word that can be said about me. I am dead in my sins and that's all, all that can be said. Glory is for God alone. Now, there's portions of this that are right. First, yes, all glory does go to God. It's a, an ultimate point of Scripture. Romans 11, 34 to 36, for example, from him, through him, to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. And yet, there is a what I would call a relative glory, not the, the ultimate glory, but a relative glory that Jesus is saying is appropriate for you. Because he's saying at the end of verse 44, your problem if, is you are not seeking glory from God. So you should seek a glory from God. And what happens if we take this, this I'm completely worthless approach is that we end up on the other side already because, because we smuggle it in. We keep on belittling ourselves and saying, I'm worthless, I'm worthless, I'm worthless. If you do that long enough, you're going to resent God. God, why did you have to make me worthless? You're not, you're not receiving any approval or any encouragement from God. You're only receiving uh, condemnation. And so you'll try to love him, but the relationship doesn't work. And eventually, you know what you do? You go around the back door and find somebody else to tell you that you're meaningful. And we're back where we started. You're receiving glory from men. That's what encourages you. God wants to encourage us directly. That's where Jesus is taking us. What does it mean to love God, to have the love of God in you? It means that you've recognized that God loves you. And that God thinks not that you are ultimate, not at all, but God does think you are significant. He decided to love you. And you respond to that and saying, I love God. And that's where you get your glory. That's where your significance and your meaning comes from. So Jesus encourages us to refuse the glory that comes from man and to seek glory from God alone. And that's what it means to love him. So that's a question for our hearts. Where do I get my glory? The second question is this. Is anyone successfully accusing me? Is anyone successfully accusing me? Jesus finishes, Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my word? So as they see it, Moses is the one that can give them glory because they're obeying Moses. They're doing what he said. Jesus says, no, not only is he not the one that you should seek your approval from, but he will turn around and condemn you if you use him, try to, try to get salvation from him. And that's a principle that will go on into our lives no matter where it is that we try to be good on our own. Because remember, Jesus knows you'll be drawn to all sorts of good things in this life. You'll, you'll be drawn uh, to, to things that God has created that are good, but if they are not pointing you to Christ, they will turn on you. They will condemn you. So you, if you like doing good deeds, if you're a nice person and you do a lot of good things for other people, someday your good deeds are going to come back around and say, what about all the times you knew what to do and you failed to do it? What, what about all the times that you knew what was right and you refused? If, if you like to be a kind person and, and that's what you think is significant and important, someday kindness will come back to you and it will say, what about all the people that you refused to be kind to? What about that? If, if you like to be a good church member and you like to show up to church activities and that's what you rely on, someday church will come back to you and it will say, what about all the ways that you didn't serve well in church? Pick anything in the world. Someday, if you set your hope on it and it's not Jesus Christ himself, it will come back to condemn you. The only way to not be condemned is to be justified by Jesus Christ. 
Only Jesus Christ gives the promise. Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Only Jesus can promise that. Everything else will condemn you. It doesn't have the power to save. So ask your conscience. Is something condemning me? Is there something in my life that says, you're guilty, you failed, you're wrong? Well, the solution isn't to try to prove that you're not actually guilty. The solution is simply to say, I turn to Jesus Christ. He is my only hope. The solution is simply to say, I I can't get help anywhere else. Jesus Christ says, he'll forgive me. Jesus Christ says his blood paid for my sins. And so I trust him. And follow the clue that he gives you at the end. He says, if you do not believe Moses' writings, how will you believe my words? Well, go back to the scriptures. Jesus is not saying reject the scriptures and don't use them. He's saying read all of them. Read them from beginning to end and learn this message that you are guilty on your own, but in Jesus Christ you have hope. Examine your heart. Is anyone successfully accusing me? You know, as, as you look at your heart, you may find some things that aren't so good in them. You, you may find things that are not trusting in Jesus Christ. So don't forget his purpose statement. Even as he speaks very hard words to his audience, verse 34, I say these things so that you may be saved. So don't try to kill Jesus. Don't try to make him go away. Don't try to change him. Don't try to get a different version that works better for you. Turn to him. Don't just settle for a heart that that gets angry and wants to kill. Settle for a heart that is forgiven by Jesus Christ. Settle for a heart that knows God's love for you and that can rest in that, that remembers Jesus Christ is alive. He is the one who gives life. And he makes that promise to all who trust in him including those who have tried to kill him. Let's pray together. Our Lord, we thank you for these words that you spoke. Difficult words in many ways, as you you spoke to the greatest, most, most knowledgeable, most faithful servants of God alive at the time, and yet you recognized in their hearts that they did not know you. We thank you that while you were on earth, you spoke the truth even to them. And we pray that you would speak that truth to our hearts now. Whatever our situation may be, whether we are have been Christians a long time or do not consider ourselves Christians, help us to hear the truth of what you say, that you are the only one who can save us. That there's nothing else, no matter how good in this world, that offers us life, but everything else only ends in death. So help us to turn to you. Help us to rely wholly upon you. We pray this in your name. Amen.